The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So what I want to do is continue talking about risk. We've already talked about risk um, quite a bit uh, last time. Um, what I want to do partly is um, sort of emphasize some specific points and I think partly go over uh, some of the ideas that have to do with a community sharing its own risk. So uh, rather than risks, risk um, through formal insurance markets, talk about what happens if people try to insure each other. And there, what's, what that do does is it creates a nice context for think uh, thinking about institutions in general and how, you know, the fact that people live together, how that might actually change their, uh, I think it's the display settings. Uh, I think we need to move to, okay. Um, so how the fact that people live together in one place and have to deal with each other on a long run basis, how that affects the ways in which they, they can structure their economic lives to help each other. So it gets into a question which is beyond, I think moving us, beyond what we've usually been talking about, which is individual decision making towards a more collective action kind of uh, perspective. So we want to slowly move towards not just what happens at the level of the individual, but why doesn't the collectivity together generate good outcomes? And uh, this is a good in, in into that question. So we're going to talk. Uh, so I'll give you a set of examples of collective action, and we'll start talking about a bit about the collective efforts to improve things. I'm not sure what, when, uh, what's happening, but we'll figure this out. Um, so the first, I think, first, um, just to remind you, um, we were talking about risk and um, in particular, the fact that poor people face extremely high levels of risk. This is, I mean, relative to, uh, and I'll show you, uh, I said that yesterday, and I'll show you, today I'll show you some numbers on that, just, just, just to get us uh, onto that. Just to summarize where we were last time, um, what we talked about primarily were sort of both that the poor face a lot of risk, and that they do a lot of things to mitigate risk, but those things are not necessarily good for them. So the examples we talked about are, for example, going to work when your income goes down, but when you go to work when your income goes down, typically that's when everybody else's income also went down, so they also go, all go to work. That drives wages down and makes everybody potentially worse off. So in, in, in principle, uh, this, and the second example, um, maybe we talk, what's another example of a, a costly thing you could do to mitigate risk? Yeah? Um, farm several pieces of land that are far apart from each other. Right. Farm several pieces of land far apart so that they don't have the same risk profile. You could choose not to take a crop that might be more successful because you're worried that uh, if you spend money to buy new seeds and it doesn't turn out to be successful, then you lose more money. And if you just used your seeds from the previous one. Any other? Choosing a bunch of different jobs that are specializing in one. Yeah, choosing a bunch of different jobs rather than doing one. Why, didn't you, why do you want to specialize? Uh, it allows you to become more productive, right. more skilled. So you give up, sorry? Efficiency. Efficiency, exactly. You just get better at a job if you do it uh, more with more company. Yeah. You get worse at the other job if you go really close to a job. It's harder to get any particular job. Yeah. Just so you like dropping a class. Like if you're doing 15 classes, you probably you know, 
15 is a high number. Uh, <laughs> um, OK, so, so I think you can see the logic of this. So the question is, we, uh, we already talked a bit about the kind of the market for insurance. Um, what we didn't talk as much about is why don't people help each other? You know, one solution to this problem is just helping each other. And so the logic of helping each other is very, very simple. Uh, We each get maybe independent shocks. And so it's quite likely that, you know, when somebody else gets a shock, I don't, and vice versa. So we can kind of split the shock. So anything bad happens, we don't bear all of it. We can pass on a part of it to somebody else. That seems straightforward. So why don't we, why doesn't that solve most problems? That's sort of the question we're going to spend some time thinking about. It's a very simple idea, right? We, we don't need to go to an insurance company. We can just pool together our own risk. Are too expensive, like if you like hospitalization costs, like how many people think, are you going to pull together for that? And sometimes people think that they shouldn't have to pay for someone else's. How many people should we pull together? As many as possible. If why why as many as possible? Because then it's more diversified. R right. So if we think that, so if you, you have this example, if you know the probability. Here, let's say they have independent uh, probabilities. Two people, they have a probability, you know, of a quarter that they both end up with a bad shock, right? With a, what, what's a, what's that probability if there were n people? One over n squared. <coughs> n squared. <coughs> Think about what, what the problem is. The problem is half that, I think you meant the other, you just exp inverted the exponents. It's 1 over 2 to the power m. You just, I think you're writing it in, yeah. It's 1 over 2 to the power n. So as n goes to infinity, the number of people who, who get shocks together is going to 0. So that's sort of a very simple idea. Um, the so question is, why doesn't it happen? And that's sort of what we're going to spend our time talking about. Um, so we, it does happen. The first answer is it does happen. So here's a nice, nice example. Um, and it says something about, actually, it's an in, interesting example. Um, so it turns out that. that the way it works in Nigeria, I don't actually give you money. I don't actually give you money when something bad happens to you. What do I do? I loan you money, and in particular, I if if you are and if you are expected to pay me back, I ask for less payback. If I'm expected to pay you back, I pay you more than what I was supposed to owe you. So it's like think of a we usually interest contracts tend to be completely inflexible, right? You know, I pay back um, I pay back um, my mortgage. Uh, is whatever 5.4 percent. I pay 5.4 percent every year till the mortgage is paid. That's not what credit looks like in in, in Nigeria. Uh, in these villages, he found that you know, 
the interest rate itself is very flexible. So I, I, I pay more than what I owed in some sense when the interest rate is, uh, when you are doing badly, and I pay less than what I owed when you're doing well. And that's a way to provide insurance, but it goes through this cover of a loan. Okay. Word of mouth. Perfectly good question. We'll come back. Let's come back to that. I want to spend a minute before we get to that question on a more basic question, which is, why do you think they do this? What, 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 what's different about, so what's the, why do you think that they go through this loan mechanism? So then they, what they seem to be doing is giving you, uh, paying you more on your loan when you do badly, and paying you less on your loan when, you, when the, the payer is doing badly. Why does that make any sense? What, 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 could, be, what could be driving that, uh, that structure? Yeah? Because they know that, when, that later on when they'll probably be doing badly, that they'll get paid and that it'll but, help them. But why don't they just give them money? Why through the loan? The question here I'm asking is why is it that I give you a discount on your loan rather than just handing you some cash? What, what, what is that pointing to? Like a desire to feel, or I guess I'd almost like a desire not to feel like you're giving a handout. So, so one possibility is, is that it's, it's sort of a cover, right? That's an interesting idea. It's a, it's a cover for, uh, for, you know, I'm giving you the money, but uh, it's not so much that, you know, people are not seeing that, you know, I'm handing you some cash. They're seeing that, you know, I actually am paying you some money back for a loan. So in that sense, it's a, it's a, it's a cover. But it's not clear that that's, you know, maybe everybody else also knows that you're poor. It's not so clear that it's so hard, you know. Um, you, had, you had a comment? Um, they, don't want to become, they don't want them to think that it becomes dependent on the amount of money that they give. Because if they give you money, then they can just give you money and then they can just keep doing what they're doing. Well, why would that be any different? I could always say that I'm doing badly and you'll pay me more on the loan I gave you. Why would that be any different? So what you're saying is related to what they're saying, which is that one thing that about a loan is that a loan is suggests that using the loan suggests that if this is making use of a pre-existing financial relationship, so an ongoing relationship, the difference between my giving you money uh, seems to be mostly that in a sense these are people who already had a financial relationship. So it's, it's the case that, you know, I, a lot of these people either owe one or the other one money already. And adjusting the terms of that suggests that it's not so much. So in other words, it's not clear that what this isn't telling us is simply that the people who have these transactions are already people who've had a stock against each other. So it's not the case that, so it's, 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 you know, you keep count and say, you know, it's not clear. So instead of thinking of this as being, the loan as being a, a separate financial product, one way to think about it is that 
you know, we keep accounts. And, uh, you know, I've done you five favors, you've done me three favors. And the net is two favors. And the loan amount really reflects our netting out of those favors. So we keep, a, so in other words, what, what is nice about a loan is it's a net, I, either I owe you or you owe me. It's a net accounting device for keeping track of who's done who fa how many favors. So it's a, by thinking of it in loan terms, it creates a natural framework for thinking about this as a kind of a social accounting device. I keep track. How do I keep track of, like, maybe people also say, well, I, you know, I did you seven favors and you've done me one. Uh, I have heard people at least say things like that. So, you know, the same psychology, it's a, it's a good way to keep track. Thinking of it in terms of loan makes it clear that what you're trying to do is keep track of, of an ongoing relationship. It's a stock. You know, I gave you 100, uh, you paid me back 50, then I gave you 30, uh, then you gave me 200, and by, when I add those up, every stage, what I really care about is not how many times what happened, but the net amount you owe me. And that's a good way to account for the relationship. So I'm kind of, we can keep track of, you know, am I someone who owes you or you, are you someone who owes me? By sort of counting that amount. And that way we don't need to keep track of all these other numbers, you know, whether it was 20 once and 15 another time. It's just one number which is kind of measures our collective obligation. And, the, the reason um, that that we would like why would we why would we like to keep track of the collective obligation? Why why does it matter that we keep track of the collective obligation? It, it's so. Security for who? Uh, I would say that in the community, if there's one person who is taking thousands and thousands from someone else, I know that if that person asks me for money, I would know the person. Right. So one, 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 one advantage of that might be that it kind of summarizes you know, my status in the collective system. So it may be that, you know, uh, everybody knows I owe, uh, I owe you 50 and so in, and then nobody will want to lend me much more because it looks like I'm just somebody who takes money from everybody and never gives them. So if, you know, it's a good way to keep track of, of whether there's someone who's sort of trying to beat the system. But there's, there's an, another maybe less, even simpler reason why you may want Speak up. Avoid moral hazard, um, which is essentially basically the same thing. But Why would it avoid moral hazard too? Because, I mean, it's an accountability system. So, like, everyone in the community is kind of aware of, it's a way of keeping track of it on a smaller scale with a larger company. For example, that's in a city, you couldn't really do it. Right. So, it could, that's the same, basically the same thing. But in some ways, I think there's an even simpler reason why you may want to keep, keep track of it which is simply, um, it may well be that I just vis-a-vis -vis someone else, he may want to know, um, you know, how many times has this guy taken from me? And I may want to just put a limit to that because I know that at some level, I'm going to die in, in 20 years or something. And so I'm going to say, look, you know, uh, if it's reciprocity, so that the reason I'm giving him is X, uh, you know, that he will pay me back eventually, then uh, I want to know whether it's reasonable to expect that he will, you know, I'll get enough back from him. So if I, if I think that basically the reason why I'm giving him the money is because he will eventually, you know, give me back the money when I need it, well, if my future is 20 years and I've given him, you know, $5 million, I'm unlikely to get that much back. So I want to know roughly where I am in that transaction because that's, that's the only way that I can kind of make a rational decision about whether it's worth continuing. I mean, if he owes, so I want to, 
if my reason for being in the relationship is that I also think that I'm going to get some favors from him, then knowing how much he already owes me is a way to keep track of, you know, how much can I reasonably expect to get back from him? If, it's, if that number is already way past anything, that, then I don't need to give him extra favors to get, it, get more back. At some level, I, I, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to collect. So then if there's some kind of a, um, rational, so I might want to limit my exposure to him. Because in some sense, I know that he's never going to pay off to invest so much in a particular person. So that's, it might be a useful accounting device. So I think that the, the Chris Udry, who came up with this, who did this study, his interpretation very much was this, that they're keeping track of you know, how, how much they owe each other. That, that everybody knows roughly, you know, I, do, I owe this guy this much, which is within reasonable limits. It's not too much, and therefore, uh, I can expect to get it back eventually. So here's a, the, 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 this is a table from Chris's, Chris's paper, uh, and it's, it's just a very simple point, but it's worth looking at the paper, it's sort of striking. So it's the monthly interest rate. These are huge numbers. That's why it's worth looking at. <coughs> the monthly interest rate, when the borrower gets no shock, he pays four percentage points less per month. That's a lot, right? Four percentage points. What, what's, what's, what's four percentage per month compounded? What's the component? Close to 50 percent. So that's like 50 percent off. You know, so you know, you're getting like 4% per month less. Now think, look at the other number. When the lender it has a bad shock, no shock, he charges basically 10 percentage points less per month than when he has a shock. So that number is you know, the difference between minus 7.5 and and 2.6 is, is basically 10 percentage points. But when he has a shock, he charges 10 percentage points more. So those are massive numbers. I mean, those are like huge. He's, he, the interest rates just move enormously, suggesting that there is actually substantial resource transfer that's going on. Yeah? So is this like, like he's, he actually charges, or the person just chooses to pay more? Like he chooses, so we don't know that. I mean, he, he, well, we, all we observe is that the person pays that much more when, when the lender gets a shock. But the difference, I mean, just to get the order of magnitude, these are very, very large numbers. So these are substantial transfers going on um, in both directions. On the other hand, there's still 10% of, of a loan. So it's like, you know, the stock is much bigger. So these people have a law ongoing ledger with each other, and then they, they pay, pay uh, they change that number by having a, changing the interest rate by a lot. Um, now what, what's that also telling us? It's also telling us something about this, the scope of this relationship, right? Because if these are people, so if, if the way I'm going to get insurance is by getting even a 10 percentage point reduction in the interest rate. So I say the interest rate is 15 percent and I get 10 percentage points off. But I owe you $100. How much do I save? Say five dollars. Right? I was going to pay you fifteen per dollars, and I now pay <coughs> five five dollars. The main point is that the amount of insurance that you can get through this system is still very limited by the amount of loan there is. Because you know, if I'm giving you a discount on a loan, 
then that depends on the loan amount I had. So if the loan amount was a million dollars, then a discount on that is worth a lot. If these are poor people and their loan amount, net loan amount is ten dollars, then the fact that I'm getting a discount on the loan is not giving me that much insurance. So the downside of thinking about it in, in loan terms is in principle this, 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 this could be a relatively small number. So I think these interest rates are high, but they're not high enough to turn a small number into a small number. Okay, so what I want to do next, um, so that's sort of one thing to keep in mind. I'll we'll come back to this. Um, is I want to talk a little bit more about other forms of insurance. So one form of insurance we observe is this loan which is the, and that has its advantage that it's a nice accounting device. I can keep track of what's going on. It has a disadvantage that, you know, it, if I haven't given you a loan, then I can't help you. It sort of goes through this loan. So if I, if there, if, if I, you only owe me $5, then it's not going to be a big transfer because, you know, you can at most let off the interest on the $5, but the interest on $5 is, 50 cents, and that's not going to make a big difference to me. So in general, that limits the scope of the system. Now, what I want to talk about is a bit stuff from Thailand, um, which is different because it's, it's uh, our colleague, uh, Robert Townsend, has been studying these villages for many, many years. And I'll show you some data from what he's, what he's collected. And then we'll, we'll see that the way insurance is offered in Thailand is very different in principle. Okay, so institutional form in Nigeria, it's a loan. In Thailand, we'll see what it is. So first, here's a, here's a nice table. It's sort of a fact that I've been saying many times. It just says, how much risk do people bear? So what this this table is each row is a farmer. For different farmers, we have, they don't have data for every farmer, but two things to note. One is look at the best year and the worst year for these farmers. They're somewhat correlated, but not perfectly, right? The best year for some farmers was 85. The worst year for some farmers was 85. The best year for some farmers was 88. The worst year for some farmers was 88. Why am I emphasizing the correlation? These are all within the same village, within one village. Why am I emphasizing the correlation? To emphasize that the shocks are independent. Yeah. So that there is scope for insurance. Insu you can, I can insure you only if, you know, we don't both get into trouble at the same time. So the worst year of the, for one farmer is not the worst year for the other farmer. The second thing is look at the magnitudes. That last column, column is the percentage kind of, if you look at the harvest amounts, the best year and the worst year, the differences are massive. It's just the amounts, I'm just, I just want to look at you the amounts. The amounts are impressive because think about, you know, you, you, you got an income of 51 year and 115 the next year. Those are big differences. Anything else that strikes you? Maybe this may be difficult to see, but 
One thing that's interesting is that if you look at the, it's not that those pe people who have oh, average less harvest, the risk seems to be independent of that. So richer people seem to have roughly the same risk as poorer people. So it, everybody seems to be exposed to risk. It's not that the rich people have less risk. Like be, the, take the maximum maximum harvest, the, the maximum harvest, the bigger pe people with the bigger maximum harvest don't look. This table is nice too. It goes back to answering the, the implied question, what's going on? What's the source of risk? And that's sort of, what is it all the same household? Sorry? Is it all the same household? No. Yeah, these are the same households as the previous table. Same, the numbers, P35, 36, these are the same households. They're all in the same village. And this is asking, why did you face risk? And again, um, mostly it has to do with weather. Though, uh, for some people, there's one person who says that insects is the biggest source of risk. Someone's best year was also someone's worst year. How rain could be the problem for Yeah, so that's, that's, that's. Someone else wants to suggest the answer? I mean, I think it indicates that, I mean, there's two potential answers. One, rain could be the answer. Maybe some of these fields are irrigated, but judging by the variation that even the wealthiest fields, which presumably would have the greatest potential <coughs> irrigation, the fact that there's still pretty big fluctuations is probably not the answer. I, mean, I think it's indicative that there's other factors at work and the rain but, fall. But they're saying that it's rain. So sure. So, I mean, maybe they don't realize. I mean, I think if they realize what their, what the other farmer was doing was causing them to be more successful, they'd probably try to do it. So maybe they didn't realize that fertilizer, maybe that they got unlucky and got hit with a disease that they weren't able to recognize. They didn't realize. That could be. That could be different crops. Yeah. So the most obvious explanation is that some of them are doing very different crops. So it might be some crops hate water, like you know. Uh, and uh, others really like it. Like rice really adores water. But um, cotton or chilies hate water so you know so the crops which you know if you you get too much rain you get lower output and uh, crops which are which are very you know output is always increasing in rain and so one possible explanation is that they were planting <coughs> planting different crops so i planted we both planted at the same time i'm planting a crop which will hurt if if the rain is bad and will do well when the rain is good and the other way around that's one possibility. Other possibility is that they're just microclimates, that the, the rain is, rain is um, sort of, you, you get, after all, uh, what matters is not so much rain as such, but rain at the right time. So I, I plant on a particular day, my saplings have just come out of the ground, that's when I need rain, when the, the plant is young. And if I plant, so the, it may well be that the rain on those five days was very good, but then the guy who planted later, he thought the rains would be better in five days, and then the rains were really not better. Uh, re they were really bad. So it may very well be that there is either geographical variation in rainfall within a local area, or just over time. So that the, you know, I planted on a particular day, I needed the rain in 10 days after that when the saplings came out, I got the rain. Um, you didn't get the rain. So I think both of those are plausible. 
So I just wanted you to look at this because I talk, keep talking of risk, but this is sort of a much better way to look at it. You just see the magnitudes of it and the sources of it. So I thought these tables were very nice. Now what he goes on to do in, in this paper is asking what do, how do people deal with risk? And so he start, he's, he, he's describing three villages. They're within very close to each other to the point where one of the villages people actually use the financial institutions in the other villages. So they're very close to each other. They're exactly in this area where the rainfall was measured. So the risk is roughly what you saw. So the risk is about what you, you know, we got a sense of this risk. And in Nigeria, we saw that people respond by borrowing from each other. Here, in this particular village, there are five different funds for, so there's a village savings fund, and the village savings fund is actually a, an equity fund. Uh, these guys actually pay you a different rate of return depending on what the borrowers were willing to pay. So I put in money into this fund, and um, then you come and borrow, I can charge you, a, I'll, you know, you're willing to pay 20%, um, then that money gets rolled back to me. So it's a fund which has a variable interest which depends on the village demand levels. What, what does that, that what, 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 what do you think should happen to the, to the interest rate when the rainfall to in that fund when the rainfall is good or bad? How would it vary? You go up when the rainfall is good or down? So one possibility is it'll go up because when the rain when the rainfall is good, productivity is high, people are willing to buy more inputs to produce. And that would mean that the rainfall will, is that good for insurance or bad for insurance? Yeah. <coughs> That's good for insurance because the people who are getting high productivity shocks are borrowing. But you could imagine the opposite, which is a, a fund with a, a variable interest rate where we only borrow from it when we are desperate. Then you might see the demand for those funds being particularly ex high when there is rainfall is bad because we're all trying to borrow from that to, to survive. And at that point, very few people are going to lend. The interest rate is going to go up. That's going to be bad for insurance. So it depends very much. A, a variable, rather a fixed uh, interest fund, a variable interest fund can be either good or bad for insurance. Then there is a fund for purchase of pigs. pigs. Here the interest rate is fixed, but there's a rollover provision. Rollover provision is if you, if you are in trouble and you can't pay, then I can let you keep the loan for longer. You pay more, but you don't have to pay back now. Is that good for insurance or bad? Assuming that the person is going to pay it back, it's good for insurance. Rollovers are good for insurance. Uh, there's, a, there's a fund for purchase of fertilizer. So each of these is like a, almost like a, is it like a proper financial institution at the village level. So in this village, there's like, you know, you can go, the leader has organized a bunch of funds and you can, you, you can, sub, you can save money to buy pigs in this fund. 
And right now, if I've saved money and you want to buy pigs, you can borrow from this fund. And likewise, there's a money fund for buying fertilizer, a rice bank where the rice I grow, I can store. And when I need rice, I can take rice from it. And there's a healthcare fund where we each put in money and if, some, if somebody gets sick, he gets to spend it. So this is a village which is rich with financial institutions. These are not loans. In particular, the healthcare fund is a, is a or the rollover is, is something where I'm making a direct transfer from to the peop people who are, uh, who are hurting. But I mean, I guess it's somewhat, but it's, it's not bilateral loans. These are kind of financing from a financial institution. So this is the main point I'm making here is that here you see a very different source of insurance. This is organized through collective action. Everybody is getting together and lending to everybody else. Now, is he, he goes down a few more miles from Maywak to a village called Sopwak. And what does he see? Well, on paper, it looks very similar. But here's the problem. All the loans are in default. Or not a loan, all, but a lot of loans are in default. Is this good or bad for insurance? Anybody else? Why is a loan a default bad for insurance? I mean, because then the people who are putting in the money won't get any money. But maybe the person who is defaulting is the one who needs to not pay. It's not clear that default is bad for insurance. Problem is, with if there's default, then nobody will money, put money in the, into the bank. So if, if people are willing, so default is in a sense a form of insurance, right? I allow you to not pay when you can't pay. But if, if there's a lot of default, and I think that's malified, then I may not put money into the bank. So again, it's not clear whether it, which way it goes, but he interprets this as saying that these places, these banks, nobody's putting money into them. So these banks are kind of defunct, yeah. How could a default not be that? Oh, we could imagine a world where um, that's exactly how we provide insurance. So um, we each, you know, imagine that the rule is year one, if you have a shock this year, you borrow. If you're year two, if you again have a shock, then you default. We write it off, happens in one time out of 10, or one, one time out of 20, but you know, that's, this, it can happen to any of us, and when it's really bad and I've had two shocks in a row, it's better for me to not have to pay back than you to give me a yet another loan. There's no particular reason why default would be bad for insurance if we could make sure that the default is limited. Doesn't the, doesn't the insurance company just lose all that money? Then? Yeah, but it counts that into its, think of that as being, the insurance company is losing that money, but remember, when the insurance company makes a payment, it also loses money. Right. So just think of it as a form of payment. Default could just uh, be a form of insurance. Because I could be paying people in the form of default. You don't have to pay. Fine. You don't have any money, you don't have to pay. That's a perfectly legitimate form of insurance. It's just the question is whether it's deliberate, in which case there'll be too much of it, and in that case the system won't work. Yeah? That may be the case when there's an insurance company or a government which is writing off the loan, but when it is the villagers themselves pulling their I, I, I guess the lot is relative to what, what they're willing, what they were planning for. There's nothing else about lot of default 
right? It's just what you're planning for. I could plan for, you know, one loan out of file will be defaulted, and the others will just absorb that loan loss. It might be fine. It may be a form of insurance. Default is a natural form of insurance. It's worth understanding that it is not, nothing obviously bad about default. If it's if it's completely just, I have no choice. I default. That's a perfectly good way to insure myself because I, then I don't need to pay when I'm in really bad shape. It's when I start using this as an excuse to not pay that that it makes a difference. Yeah. I think I can accept that because usually the default is when the intent was for you to get that paid back. So if you're using the default as a form of insurance, and it, to me it's no longer a default, then it's just a form of insurance. Okay. <laughs> I, I can't argue with that. I mean, that seems like we're arguing about words. So I, I, I think the default just means I don't pay the loan. Uh, and uh, when I don't pay the loan, that might very well be desirable. Uh, now, as you can see, their view is a bit that is not actually necessarily a good idea to collect. Because they're basically, they're, they're taking the view that you know, these people who are defaulting are defaulting because they need to default. So it's not clear what default means here. And that's what, it's worth understanding. The third village, then he walks down to a third village. The third village is a few, few miles down, and this is as none of these funds exist. So one village, all the funds are working well. In the second village, there's a lot of default. The funds are still there. Third village, no funds except one. And you are in the Nigerian mode, where you're just borrowing from each other. So what's the advantage of a fund over borrowing from each other? Yeah, let me see if it's someone else wants to answer. What's the advantage of a fund over borrowing from each other? Why? Well, an individual has a limited budget constraint, whereas if people pool their money together, they might right. It's a way to pool many more people in. So that's, that, that's the advantage of a fund. So why do you think, what, what do you think is going on? Why do these villages which are very similar have same kind of risk next to each other have different, very different patterns? Think about what it takes for such an institution to, institution to exist. Right. So you need to. Ha so the way this, one of these funds works is by saying that I'm going to put money into it now because I can get money into it in the future. What does that assume? <laughs> yeah. In that that there is a future. So in other words, if I think that. Everybody else is going to default today. I should default as well, because there will be no few fund in the future. Right. So this is a classic kind of um, problem of, of anything that's sort of sustained by the future. It depends on there being a future. So imagine that I think that. For, this, is, this is the problem that right now a lot of microcredit organizations are facing. Microcredit organization promises you a loan if you pay back your loan. Now suppose you, suppose you, don't, you think that nobody will, else will pay back their loan. What's going to happen to the microcredit organization? It's going to go bankrupt. If it goes bankrupt, what's going to happen to your future loan? It doesn't, doesn't exist. So basically, if this fund, if everybody else expects people to default in the future, then I should default now. So these is rational. If everybody else is expected to default, it is rational for me to default. 
If everybody is expected to pay back in the future, then it's irrational for me to pay back. Because then the fund will be there for a long time. So I think this is the, this is the sort of the reason why funds, so all these kind of informal institutions are fragile because they rely on uh, this kind of coordination. I only want to repay if everybody else wants to repay. Or at least as long as enough people want to repay that the money will, the fund will be going. If I expect that lots of people will default in the future, I should default now. Because the fund is going to go out of business, I'm not going to get anything out of it in the future, so I might as well just stop having anything to do with it. So it totally depends on trust. If I believe that everybody else is going to behave well, then I should behave well. If I think that everybody else is going to behave badly, then it's over in some sense. That's one central weakness of these kinds of informal institutions. They rely on the expectation that, uh, expectation that uh, I'm going to behave well in the future. Yeah? So why would you ever, like, if everyone else is going to pay back in the future, wouldn't it still be better for you to default now if you were being selfish? Because the funds still don't exist whether or not you No, but then you can't borrow again. Then they can say, look, you know, you've defaulted. You're never going to, or you didn't pay the money in when you needed to. You were supposed to pay money into the fund. You didn't pay. Now you're out. Now, but if you come and ask me uh, for money to put money into the fund, and I know that everybody else is planning to default, I'm never going to do it. And if I have... If I ever get a loan out of it, I'm going to default as soon as I can because I know everybody else is planning to default. So default in these kinds of institutions, default is entirely sort of self-fulfilling. So if I, if I expect default, I'll have default. If I expect people to behave bad, well, we'll probably all behave well. So the, probably the reason why these villages are so different is because of this expectational mechanism, <coughs> which is very important. To understand, and it's true of very lots of financial institutions. They they rely on our future compliance to work, and that's why uh, you know, for example, I mean, even even banks to some extent, right? If I decide that I'm going to withdraw my money from the bank, everybody else is going to withdraw my money from the bank tomorrow. What should I do today? I should withdraw today. That's a bank run. So a lot of financial institutions have exactly this feature. And that's why it's not so surprising to see that some villages have very good institutions, rich set of institutions, others don't. The fact that some villages have default is the same re reasoning. If once people start defaulting, everybody's going to start defaulting. Yeah. Would it be possible that in one village, for instance, a default is costlier than in another village? Maybe like socially, you'll be ostracized or something? Sure. So it could very well be that another thing that this tells us is that, for example, the leader matters. So if the leader is someone who's, who, who can enforce punishments in the village. So if I default, uh, suppose I'm supposed to pay back and I know I can pay back, but you know, I, I just refuse to do it. If the leader can basically ostracize, have me as ostracized, then in some sense, uh, I'm not going to do it. And then given that I'm not going to do it, everybody else is willing to pay into the fund. So it's going to be m huge leverage from effective le leadership. That's the other actually conclusion of this paper is that there was a good leader in, in, in the first village and he was very important in setting up these institutions, that he, he made them work. So this is, yeah. yeah I, to, I was actually going to ask that. So it seems implicit that so you have to have someone who is a good leader in order to be but what, what was that guy in the doing to make that stuff, like to keep people from the So in the paper, I can't tell you. You said that the, the leader was very uh, you know, energetic, etc. This gives a description of the leader, but doesn't tell me what he was doing so much. OK. So we already talked about moral hazard, um, other limits of insurance. So one limit of insurance, but I wanted to emphasize that because I wanted to emphasize that this is not just a limit of insurance, it's a limit of any institution that is not 
enforced by legal punishments. So anything that's not enforced by legal punishments is fragile always. It depends on, it will work if it works, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? That's sort of the main, main point of that example. That you know, if we all stop paying money into the fund, then the, the fund will die, so we, I might as well take my money and run. That's, that's, that's true of not just of insurance, of any other kind of institution. Now, moral hazard uh, we've talked about. Um, I'm going to skip moral hazard. Here's, here's a, another problem with informal insurance. This is sort of what we've been talking about a bit, but so this is, this is, we've been sort of talking about implicitly you know, default, but we've also been talking about one thing that an insurance ar arrangement demands is that when it's your turn to pay, you pay. Sometimes you get money from the fund, sometimes you pay into the fund. And you have to be willing to pay money into the fund, right? That's what makes it, keeps it going. Why do you want to keep putting money in the fund? We said this already, but just to repeat. Why would I today, I'm not, I am rich, I want to put money into the fund so that somebody else can take it out. Why would I want to do it? Why does anyone want to put money into a fund? Sorry? Yeah, eventually I'm going to either, you know, you'll pay me some return on the fund, but if it has to have an insurance component, then it has to be that the return I get on it is lower than the market return. Because otherwise, you know, the, they could have, could have borrowed from the market. It doesn't provide any insurance. So it, I, it can't be just because I want to get the money back. Because then it must be because I expect that I will be able to borrow from the fund in the future as well. So I will be willing to put money into a fund which pays lower than market rates which is what insurance is. Insurance is that I'm willing to lend to someone at lower than market rates so that, so that he doesn't, when he's in bad shape, he doesn't suffer too much. So that's what's insurance. That would also probably be the reason why wealthier people would be less likely to give into a fund, right? Because they're already exposed to less risks. Right, so exactly. So I thought you'd ask, I thought you said that <coughs> One reason they may want to do it is that they, they feel the same need as, so why would I put money into, what's an insurance fund? Insurance fund is a fund where I put in money so that other people can be helped in return for the fact that some, they will put in money and I will be helped. Why would I put in money uh, now? Because I expect to be helped in the future. So what are the kinds of people who want, don't want to join that fund? You already gave one answer, which is people who are rich. They don't expect to get helped. So that's why you're going to see that if there's a lot of inequality in the village, you're unlikely to see a fund. Because, you know, the rich don't really think that they can be helped by the poor. If they ever need money, they're going to eat them, you know, $100,000, the poor won't have it, and if otherwise they won't need money. Yeah. I think the chapter also mentioned Right, so you need to be forward looking. To be willing to uh, behave well, you need to be forward looking. If, you, if I always think that, well, I'll, I'll just not pay now and you know, whatever happens in the future, then that's not going to work. You need to be forward looking. And, and what's the point about migration? Why is migration important? That is, you have to expect to be in that area to in the village. Yeah, you need to be in the village to benefit from the fund. You need, if I expect to go away, I'm not going to be. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to be here to benefit from this fund. So if there's a lot of mobility in a place, then everything falls apart. So if you're nearer, so one of the things that uh, is 
villages that are closer to the road to a big city find it harder to insure each other. Uh, why? Because they don't, everybody there has a link to the city. So they don't know whether they are, whether they're going to help from the village or they're going to get to the, go to the city and get a job there. And so given that I am not committed to being in the village, it's very hard to give me insurance. So, so all of these things, you need low mobility, low inequality, and forward looking people. Yeah. Right, then that's an excellent point. A what would a bank account do? A bank account would undermine insurance. Why? Because in a bank account, I now can get high return on my savings. So I'm going to be more tempted to say when I have money, it's more tempting for me to put it in the bank account rather than put it in this fund which is going to pay me a low return because it's trying to help out other people. So any outside options, that are you provide, so financial development might undermine local institutions. So you might actually see worse institutions where the financial system is better from formally. Yeah. yeah I guess I'm confused though, because I misunderstood the whole fund. You said that the market rate was higher than the fund rate. Yes, yes. So if there, if, even if there was a bank and you experienced some hardship, you would be more inclined to go borrow money. Oh, absolutely. It's the other way around. Question is, who do you borrow money from? The, what the bank does is makes it too easy for me. I, today I have money and you need money. I'm going to put my money in the bank. That's why you can't get money from the fund. There's a fund is a two-way street, right? I need to put in money, you need to take out money. I'm only willing to put in, as my options of putting money elsewhere get better, it's going to be harder and harder to force me to put money into the bank, into the fund. Especially if, right? Let me be clear. What are we saying? There's a fund. What's a fund? The fund is that I, I put money into it, I get lower than market rates. Why? Because I want to give that money to someone else who needs it desperately, providing insurance. There's also a bank which pays the market rate. Now, as the market rate gets, goes, it's higher. It's harder and harder for, for the guy who has money today to not feel tempted to put his money into the bank. Yeah, you, you had a comment? Um, but like, there's a threshold, right? Like the bank, you have to have a certain amount of money before you can open a bank. Sure, okay. so it, maybe the bank is not actually available to you. But if the bank is available to you, that might actually be bad for insurance. Is that, that's sort of maybe surprising that you know, a bank shows up and that actually undermines people's ability to insure each other. It is too easy to now park your money elsewhere. Other reasons why informal insurance doesn't work very well, we've also talked about, um, we talked about the coordination quite a lot already. You know, if, ever, if I expect to default on the fund, then you will default too, this coordination. Also, you know, farmers, you know, you would expect that these, these funds only work because I have some, uh, I know when you need, really need money and when you don't. Because otherwise you can always say, I need money. So you're not going to let in people who are very isolated. So people who are not in the village network don't get into these funds. They tend to be off people who are relatively well connected to the village community. Why? Because you know, I need to know, know whether you're lying or not. And if you, are, you live next to me, I know that you know, yes, your cow died or whatever. Your pig was uh, you know, eaten up by a I don't know, tiger or something. I don't know, whatever happens to pigs. But you know, if, if, you, if, you, if, I, if I live, don't, you live far away, how do I know wh whether you are you, you're in trouble or not? So it tends to be that this is, it tends to be concentrated among people who know each other. The scope of the insurance is limited. Yeah. 
And finally, uh, in some sense, this is a very bad mechanism for dealing with shocks which affect everybody in the village, obviously. You know, if there is one blight in the village which affects everybody, this is not going to help anybody. Because nobody can help each other. So that's so that goes back, takes us back to where we were at the end of last the last lecture, which is saying, on the other hand, formal insurance markets are hard to develop. That's where we ended last time. We said formal insurance markets are hard to develop. Why? Because people are suspicious of these products, they don't understand them, they're too complicated, you know. They have all these exclusions which you don't understand, so you don't like it. I was telling the story of all these women who got really upset because uh, one of their friend's husband died, but the medical health insurance didn't pay for it. Health insurance was actually right in not pay for it in formal terms because their, their contract said, we'll only pay for people who go to the hospital. He died at home. But that didn't mean that they, they thought that, well, something bad happened. Why aren't you paying for it? So. Uh, that was a, so they basically got very upset. So insurance is confusing, it's formal insurance has rules, which you, if you're semi-literate, you don't understand. It tends to be well, quite limited in other ways, because unlike, I know a lot about my neighbors. I know if his cow was eaten up by a, uh, by a tiger, for example. On the other, insurance company doesn't know anything about my neighbor. So it can't insure things like that. In fact, there's a very nice story um, that, um, so this is cow insurance. I bring up the example because it's a good, good example. So insuring cows is a big issue in every developing country because cows are a major asset. I mean, some countries like in Botswana, it's the single biggest asset other than diamonds, turns out. So the only two major assets in Botswana, they are cows and diamonds. Um, but most people have cows, very few people have diamonds. So, 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 so the insurance companies have been trying for a long time to insure cows. Problem is that you, know, what you, you insure cows by saying, if the cow dies, I'll pay you money. But it's convenient for cows to die because they turn into steaks. And uh, steaks are, you know, Many people like them, so they, have a, they create a, a huge moral hazard problem. So this company thought we had a very clever idea. They said, they, they said that if you claim that your cow has died, you have to bring me the ear of the cow. Okay. Dead cow, you have to cut his ear off and show it to me, or her ear off, I don't know. What happened? Uh, uh, people every time my cat died, they would start cutting off the ear and creating like a black market. For right. They, they create, so imagine my cow dies, I'm not insured. <laughs> what do I do? I cut off his ear and sell it to somebody who's insured. It created a robust market for cow ears. Everybody was buying cow ears to go to the bank and collect insurance. So that's, that's your primary problem with. Uh, with uh, sort of formal insurance. They don't know where the cow died. They have to figure out a way to track that down. That's not easy to do because of this, this uh, ear problem. Uh, so, so basically, we are between a rock and a hard place. People don't understand insurance. Insurance is incomplete um, at best because you, know, you can't really insure cows because I don't know when your cow died or not. On the other hand, if we look at insurance that comes from the community, the people who have the information, that tends to be limited for these other reasons we discussed. So we were kind of between a rock and a hard place. So I think the basic, I think the message of this, this particular area is that this is a classic area where a, a government providing some kind of a, a insurance that's not expected to break even is much more efficient because you know, if, if it is something that is, so rather than thinking of ins insurance which is market supplied, for example, a, a government scheme which says you can come to work whenever you, you need to work and will pay you a minimum wage is a very effective 
because you know if I pay you lower less enough, I mean the wage is low enough, you're not ever going to take that job. If you if you are, you know you have a real real um, a real job, you'll only take it when you're desperate. So that's a very efficient way to provide insurance because now the problem is that that's not going to fund itself. It, it's a one way one way. Uh, uh, payment for the government, but on the other hand, it provides, makes sure that anybody who's really desperate can find a job, and therefore can se uh, secure them. So, in some sense, this is a classic area. Or if you think of insurance, where people don't understand the product, well, they don't want to buy it because they don't understand the product. But if you provide it free, they'll take it. So, if the government were to actually subsidize the insurance. That might be a very good way to help poor people because it's it's something that they don't understand. It's good for them. They don't. The demand is too low because they don't know how to interpret it. On the other hand, they will get the benefits from it. So it's it's. I think insurance is a very very natural place for public intervention, and I think that's that's sort of what makes it really interesting is how to design good insurance products for poor people, which possibly combine some advantage of the market and some advantages of, the, of, of public funding. So for example, instead of the government providing health care, maybe everybody should have health insurance with some you know, appropriately designed coverage. And maybe that should be provided free to people. If they don't understand the value of it, that's fine. In the end, sick people are a burden of the government. So they might as well provide it ex, ex ante. If you want to, providing a, a job to everybody, workfare is what the, the word people use in the US, to people who want a job is a way to make sure that people, when they desperate, they have some way of generating income and that the wage at that income doesn't go down because everybody is demanding a job. So in some sense, it's a way to secure people and it's a way to do it efficiently uh, to make sure that the right people go, go to it, you don't want to give them money, you want to give them a job. Because a job has the advantage that you get targeting. So in some sense, it's a good domain to think about public policy. So I'll, I'll stop here. We we'll, might talk a little bit more about it.